we'll get started here uh, as people kind of come in the room. Uh, if, you, if I get distracted to the bottom left corner of my screen, I'm just letting a few more people in. But welcome to Nads and Ideas. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our panel will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we will open the discussion for questions that will be posed by our moderator, Dr. Whitney Lackenbauer. And uh, I might jump in as well with a few questions. So feel free to pose those through the chat function of Zoom, um, and we'll be moderating uh, the the questions from there. Uh, and again, for logistics, if you're just joining us, please do remain on mute for the call and communicate through the chat um, as best that you can. Just to uh, review our panel today, we have uh, Dr. Whitney Lackenbar will be our moderator. Then we will hear from uh, Dr. Peter Kickert and Magali, Dr. Magali Villemier, and then uh, Bianca Romagnoli, who is one of our uh, graduate fellows. So we look forward to hearing from them today on the Canadian Rangers and Resilience. And just to give you a little bit more background on NADSEN, so we are a collaborative network and we deal with, we provide timely, relevant and reliable expert advice on North American and Arctic defense and security topics. So we address three core policy challenges, um, as well as many intersection points throughout those, which include the defense role in the Arctic, NORAD modernization, the future of North American defense, and the evolving role of major powers in global strategic competition. Uh, we conduct leading edge research with students. We have a fabulous group of emerging scholars, um, as well as we, um, uh, liaison with northern stakeholders and rights holders and we do research that tests core assumptions and prompt policy innovation um, and i encourage you to to check out our website there at nadson.ca and also to follow us on twitter our wonderful postdoc dr nancy teeple does a great job updating our twitter on a lot of the uh, wonderful pieces that we have coming in uh, sometimes on a daily basis we have uh, updated research so please do check us out there. Um, we also have a really strong group of students like I mentioned as well as a strong network uh, that has a breadth of knowledge um, across different disciplines and uh, there's a people page on our website that you can also uh, look at us there. So uh, thank you very much for joining us again and without further ado to keep us to time as best we can I will now turn it over to Dr. Lackenbauer. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I was asked just to give a, a couple of minutes of, of introduction, and I promise I'll keep it to that. Some of you know me, I'm a little bit effusive sometimes, especially on a topic like the Canadian Rangers, which is so near and dear to my heart. So in addition to being an academic, I also uh, get to serve as the Honorary Lieutenant Colonel for First Canadian Ranger Patrol Group with 61 patrols across the territory north of northern BC. And just to kick things off, our theme today is about resilience. And it's a broad theme, so we're going to be chatting about it uh, oriented towards rangers specifically, but hopefully more broadly playing into a narrative that we're developing through Madsen about Arctic security often being tethered to this idea of sovereignty, but now moving that back towards uh, one of uh, security, or uh, pardon me, of resilience as one of the animating uh, ways of conceptualizing the changing Arctic security environment and what we should be doing. So this ties to broadened definitions of security. And as we've talked about in previous uh, NADSEN events, most of what the Government of Canada now does adopts much broader and deeper concepts of security. And broadening meaning moving beyond just the military sphere, so including other aspects of security or sectors of security, and then deepening, meaning not just looking at the level of security or the international level, but also deepening it down to individuals and communities. And this very much animates and frames the whole of government, or now as it's been modernized, the whole of society approach to security and attempts to horizontally link so many of the different actors that bring capacity to our collective response to security issues. A lot of this plays out in the Arctic and Northern policy framework with a whole myriad of pillars. Some people suggest this is way more than what the Harper government was doing or it's preceding Martin government or all the preceding Northern strategies. I say it's, it's just more pillars, but a lot of this really represents Canada's Northern strategy, an enduring one that goes back to 1970 and talks about the interdependent elements of development and people and environment and how a government has to balance off these dynamics. And every actor representing the Canadian state, including Department of National Defense, Canadian Armed Forces, also has a responsibility to be attuned to all of these different issues and priorities. And encapsulated there, as you see on the left of your screen, in this sweeping statement, that talks, talks about strong, self-reliant people and communities working together for vibrancy, sustainability, 
at home and abroad while expressing Canada's enduring Arctic sovereignty. And I love that because it makes it about the people and makes it about the communities that are the purest expression of sovereignty in our country. So today we're focusing on the Canadian Rangers. I'm presuming most of you have some level of familiarity, but just to give a little bit of a primer, they are intended to provide a lightly equipped, self-sufficient military presence in sparsely settled northern coastal and isolated areas. So not just in the high Arctic, right? Areas across Canada that are considered to be remote or isolated with small populations, which cannot conveniently or economically be covered by other elements of the military. So this is an enduring uh, set of roles for the Rangers that goes back to 1947 and dealing with this unique dilemma that we face in Canada. Some people refer to it as the tyranny of geography, huge space, small populations, but the need to have a presence. The mission then flowing from that is to force generate lightly equipped and self-sufficient. These are two themes we'll probably talk about in terms of capacity today in support of other Canadian Armed Forces sovereignty and other domestic operations. And I think today we're gonna to focus a lot on those domestic operations piece, but also broader issues of what sovereignty means like across Canada to different, to different communities. So what can Rangers do? What do they do? Surveillance and, and sovereignty or presence patrols. They go and ensure that the North Warning System hasn't been damaged in terms of its physical infrastructure. This is the modernized disorderly warning line across the 70th parallel and down the coast of, of Labrador and Natsiavut. Report suspicious and unusual activities. They're often referred to as the eyes and ears, but also the voice of the military who can pass along their local knowledge that they have of their areas. And then also serve as guides and expert advisors to other elements of the Canadian Armed Forces that deploy up to their local areas. They also participate in search and rescue operations. And certainly Dr. Kicker will probably have lots to say about that as, as will Dr. Villian and, and Ms. Romagnoli because they've, they've done some work and observed this uh, supporting natural and man-made disasters. Uh, Peter Kicker gave a wonderful talk yesterday online at great length about this. So he might revisit some of those themes, support humanitarian operations, assist federal and, and territorial or municipal authorities as needed, mentor and supervise the junior Canadian Rangers and participate and support events in the local community. And we're gonna wrap a lot of this together and talk about community resilience and take that community lens today to talk about what the Rangers do in addition or, or amongst this myriad uh, set of activities. What they can't do to be very clear, what they're not expected to do is to undertake tactical military training to apply kinetic effects against an adversary incursion mounting an incursion on Canada's shores. That's not what they're trained to do. In theory, it's not that they could not be trained for that. It's not proportionate to the threat environment that we're facing. And it's something that militaries decided they should not do because we have other elements that are trained and able to deploy for those things. Uh, vital point security. They're not expected to serve as police auxiliaries going out and apprehending saboteurs or acting in an aid to the civil power capacity, which might put them in a conflict of interest as residents of their home communities. And I think this is a recognition that in Canada, we have other agencies that are responsible for undertaking those tasks. We don't need the Rangers in a formal capacity to be doing those things. But they should be able to support deliberate or contingency operations within their area of responsibility in all weather conditions at all times of the year, as need be. And in terms of their uniqueness, they're assumed to be fully trained, self-sufficient, and lightly equipped. Think back to that mission that we talked about and fully clothed to operate in their area upon enrollment. There's no other element of the Canadian Armed Forces that's considered, maybe the Padres, uh, but no other element is, is considered to be trained when they join. The Rangers are expected to be bringing this knowledge with them, which fits again into the importance of community resiliency, nurturing the type of people who can contribute to the Rangers, also assuming that when domestic response capabilities are being generated for operations, that the Rangers may be able to support those operations. They're not gonna be the lead agency for the most part, or they're never gonna be the lead agency in terms of mandate, but they may be the lead in terms of the response depending upon the capacity at the community level. So a very unique model, I'm sure we'll talk about themes relating to indigenous and local knowledge, the matter in which they elect their own patrol leadership and how that informs and supports community community capacity, the fact that they turn to their own knowledge of what is appropriate clothing or what equipment should be used and they're enabled to do that. We'll, we'll hear, I'm sure, some wonderful ideas about how this connects to community capacity as well. And also, I think by nature of the experiences of 
our, our wonderful expert panel today. Also think about the Rangers not purely as a group of Inuit serving in Inuit Nunungat, or more particularly in Nunavut, but see them as an organization that has about 5,000 members and operates from coast to coast as long as throughout the middle north of Canada. And that diversity is one of the big takeaways. So when we think about resilience, we have to think about this, this rich diversity that animates our country. So the overarching theory, which I'm not gonna get into because Dr. Kickert will give us more details on this in just a minute, is talking about resilience. How can groups or individuals cope with stresses and shocks in ways that allow for them to maintain essential unity functions and structures, navigate change, including transformational change, and be able to come out of it? How are they able to retain the essential pieces of their culture, of their identity, their ability to do things, while also being nimble enough to respond to a diversity of, of pressures that they're facing? So we're focusing community resilience today. I'm going to leave it to the others to define how we want to, to, to frame that or scope that particular concept. And I think inclusive within that is also looking at forms of Indigenous resilience. Obviously something very, very significant in Canada as we find ourselves in this moment of reconciliation as a priority, but also because our population, our demographics mean that a very high proportion of individuals living in these isolated coastal and northern communities are Indigenous peoples. So it's pretty clear for any of you who know me, my heroes wear red hoodies, right? They're the rangers themselves who serve, and we're going to talk about the different ways that they serve. And also, it's the ranger instructors in red hoodies who serve both the rangers and the junior Canadian ranger program, who are also essential bridges, liaisons, facilitators to help to empower rangers as they're empowering themselves and empowering their communities. And given the research of both Bianca and Mega Lee, on ranger instructors. I'm really interested in hearing their insights into how all these different elements work together. Um, so a wonderful group that we have, and I'm just thrilled. I want to listen in. I've never got to sit on a panel where I've not been asked to talk and I've already talked too much. Um, but to hear their insights as, you know, people who've spent quite a bit of time now embedded within or immersed within the ranger uh, community and looking at it both through critical lenses as, also, as well as a diversity of disciplinary lenses. Peter Kickert, a dear friend of mine, long standing friend, is trained as a historian, now is the Irving Shipbuilding Chair in Arctic Policy at St. Francis Xavier University, and is going to bring to us uh, some of his insights from an intense research project that we've been conducting over the last couple of years on how you measure the success of the Rangers, and it was really he who brought the, the central concept of resilience as what he thought should be the guiding framework for understanding these things. Intersects very well with the work of Dr. Magali Vulierme, who wrote a wonderful dissertation on a uh, second ranger patrol group and especially the role of Canadian ranger instructors and Canadian rangers in forming it, unique relationships that very much are attuned to climate change, a changing Arctic, but also a very different take on assimilation and how we look at assimilation operating within this organization that I'll leave for her to share with us. And then, beyond, and she's now ser uh, serving as a postdoc uh, with Nadsen. And finally, last but certainly not least, Bianca Romagnoli, who's working on, and I should say for Megali, pardon me, trained as a sociologist. And then for Bianca Romagnoli, an anthropology PhD student, or PhD candidate, sorry, Bianca, at University of California, Los Angeles at UCLA, who's been working very closely with First Canadian Ranger Patrol Group and observing that patrol group, that unit, and how it functions uh, over the last year and is now based in Yellowknife. So I turn the floor over to you, Peter, and just invite all the speakers to, to just follow one after the other. If you don't mind, as a group, we'll pool all the questions till the end, and I'm sure we'll have a very vigorous conversation. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Whit. Just going to share my, uh, my screen here. Sorry, I think uh, everyone see the screen okay? Shannon, is it is up? Awesome. All right, I just wanna spend a few minutes, and Shannon's very clear, we have 10 minutes a piece, so I'm gonna fly through this, but talking about the Rangers and resilience and, and what exactly, you know, Whitney and I are, are, are meeting as we use that term and apply it into the kind of the Ranger framework. So as kind of Whitney laid out, resilience, it's a, it's a complex term, and it's one that's been defined hundreds of times across dozens of different disciplines. Uh, it, it's very, uh, it's got a lot of different meanings, but I think, in general, when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about the ability to cope with 
and respond to adversity and disturbances in our change. And a resilient system is one that can you know, withstand abrupt, distur uh, abrupt disturbances like a natural disaster, you know, wildfire, earthquake, or, and one that can kind of withstand more enduring, long standing change, something like the effects of climate change. Um, now, when people talk about resilience, it's often looking at it from a very theoretical perspective. You know, what are the building blocks, ingredients of resilience? How is that actually developed, whether it be at the individual or community or state level? Uh, and, they, and there's a lot of ideas around that. A lot's been written around that, right? What are these key variables? Um, I think that what's lacking in the literature and what certainly uh, a lot of other scholars have pointed out is that what's lacking is, is kind of more tangible, concrete examples of how you operationalize resilience. So Dr. Anita Chandra and Dr. Joey Acosta have done a ton of work on building resilience in Los Angeles, for instance, one of the uh, communities that was the first to adapt this framework to kind of bolster their own resilience as a, as a city. And they say the biggest challenge that we see it is the ongoing focus of academics and researchers on defining resilience conceptually and theoretically, rather than getting into the action and finding innovative ways to actually build resilient communities. So how do you translate this theory about what makes for resilience and actually translate that into effective action on the ground? And the Rangers do represent an organization that reflects resiliency, that builds resiliency, uh, and that operationalizes resiliency. It's an example how you, of how you build it on the ground. And really, I think it's helpful, and Whitney, you know, Whitney and I have done this, to separate it into four distinct categories, right? Community disaster resilience, community resilience, indigenous resilience, and individual resilience. A lot of these categories overlap, and building capacity in one builds capacities in the others quite often. Uh, but still, from a, from a conceptual framework, it's helpful to break them down into those four distinct parts. So to start with community disaster resilience, going back to April, right, we saw the Rangers being mobilized to assist in Operation Laser, the military's response, uh, or straight efforts to support the government of Canada's um, response to COVID-19. Uh, so hundreds of Rangers were mobilized across the country, and they did such a wide variety of tasks. They were doing everything from community wellness checks, delivering prescription medicine, uh, doing public awareness campaigns, encouraging people to wear their masks, setting up uh, operation centers. They were cutting and delivering firewood to people who needed it, clearing snow from key areas in their communities. They were delivering food, delivering supplies, going hunting and delivering fresh game and fish. They were doing a lot, right, to help support their communities, to help protect their communities. Um, at the same time they were doing that, they were doing their usual springtime tasks, which includes search and rescue, which includes watching out for the natural hazards that affect their communities, which includes responding to disasters like the Fort Vermilion Ranger Patrol did when they helped to evacuate 450 residents from that northern Alberta town during flooding. So because of their presence and because of their capabilities, Rangers often play a supporting role to other government agencies in preparing for, mitigating, responding to, and recovering from disasters they play a huge role in community disaster resilience. And that's the ability to anticipate and where possible prevent or at least minimize the potential damage a disaster might cause and to cope with the effects of a disaster if it occurs to maintain certain basic functions and structures during the disaster and to recover and adapt to the changes that result. Like really the Ranger organization has provided an answer to a very difficult question. How can targeted government investment actually build resilience in these kind of isolated remote communities that often have small populations, limited infrastructure and lack response capacity and are very distant from rapid external assistance. So again, there's lots of literature on what are the building blocks of a community disaster resilience, but generally speaking, resilience flows from people being empowered to tap into their uh, existing social relationships, their networks to assist one another, to work through a disaster together. It flows from people being empowered to use their skills and their resources and it flows from communities developing the capacities that are required to respond effectively to, to any disaster. And those span things from hazard identification, risk analysis, to trained response teams, uh, to people being, to, to community organizations being able to work together and with external agencies who might come in to also participate and help in a disaster. And the Rangers, I mean, they do this, they do this very regularly. Uh, they represent a great example of how disaster resilience can be built from the bottom up with the CAF empowering them to use their existing skills and social relationships with an organizational structure that provides them with the framework, the training, and the equipment to assist in every phase of disaster management. Specifically, the Rangers bolster community disaster resilience by their presence because they can provide an immediate response, their organization, their leadership, and their training, their ability to work with internal and external organizations and a whole of society response 
their ongoing involvement in community, uh, community preparedness and hazard risk analysis, their social relationships and networks, right, by bringing their communities together and be able to work with the different elements of their communities. And I think probably most importantly, the trust they've earned from their fellow community members. So again, in, in, the, in the discussion period, I'm happy to go into all that in more detail, what that actually means, how that plays out in disasters. But the interest of this 10 minute framework, let me community resilience. Uh, and Whitney actually introduced this more general concept already. So uh, just to reiterate what he was saying, this is a more broad concept that focuses on a community's navigate, uh, sorry, a community's ability to navigate continuous change, ongoing disruptive processes, and a social, a social ecological Characterized by uncertainty, unpredictability, and surprise. So again, lots been written about the key ingredients of community, res uh, community resilience. Don't have the time to go into every single one of these aspects, but it's everything from really strong local leadership to a positive community outlook, to a sense of pride in the community, attachment to the community, self-reliance, the ability to problem solve as a community, right? It involves strong and engaged community organizations, diverse economies. So it really runs the gamut that, that goes into building, you know, a resilient community at large. Specifically for the Rangers, they play an incredible role bolstering community resilience through the leadership they provide, through the role model uh, they provide, through the social networks they have created, to the support they provide to community events and youth engagement, through the Junior Canadian Rangers and other youth programs, to the actual material supports they bring into a community through their pay, through equipment usage rates, uh, and through the food security practices they're allowed to do while on patrol. So rather than me talk about this, very quickly, I wanted to give you some examples of what Rangers have said about what community resilience means to them, what they've shared in focus groups and interviews. And one participant at the JCR leadership in, in January 2019 said, you know, town life has made it a bit easy. You know, we have furnaces, we have running water, things are, things are easy. It's easy to grow complacent. And once that strength is gone, it'd be hard to get back. That's why getting on the land is so important. That's why getting on the land with youth is so important. It's about survival. Nothing is easy, at least not without practice. So by facilitating that practice and that on the land uh, activities, right, the Rangers are contributing to those key elements of community strength, community resilience. And when I was a little kid, I remember seeing Rangers and being proud of them. I remember them leaving on their patrols, seeing them in action. I've always thought they were awesome and wanted to join as soon as I could. Now I see young kids looking up to me in the same way and it makes me feel very proud, right? So this is, that's the idea of engaged community organizations that can bolster community pride, that can create a sense of community pride. That's also a pretty essential element of community resilience. And finally, as a ranger from Joe Haven told Whitney and I last April, you know, look at a dog team. There's always one leader in a team that looks after the rest of the team. As a leader, we have to look after every member of the patrol and care for them. In the past, being a ranger was like being a father, looking after children. And that was, after, that was from a former uh, patrol sergeant there. Again, talking about that sense of connection, that sense of social support that is so key uh, to kind of bringing communities together in that kind of resilient manner. So oftentimes indigenous resilience is lumped into community resilience in the literature, but we would argue that there's a really valid reason for having it as an exclusive category on of its own. Unique experiences, the intergenerational trauma faced by indigenous peoples kind of, you know, really does inspire a, a different category. So indigenous resilience. Lawrence Kermeyer has done a lot of work on this and he argues that Aboriginal resilience must be considered in terms of the impact of structural violence and interventions must take a long-term approach to rebuild, repair, and revitalize community strengths and institutions. So the, the experience has been different and the response, the response to those, those experiences also has to be different, has to be sustained, has to be long-standing. And certainly the Rangers play an incredible role in bolstering Indigenous resilience uh, in Indigenous communities. Right? The central wall patrols give to elders. Again, those social networks they foster and create. The elected leadership, which reflects traditional forms of leadership the intergenerational transmission of knowledge, right? Experienced members who can pass along traditional skills to JCRs and Rangers. Uh, Ranger patrols providing country food to community members. Uh, the use of indigenous languages, right? Assisting in the revitaliz revitalization of indigenous languages. So the patrol, Ranger patrols can offer a platform for building and strengthening uh, indigenous resilience. And again, just to give you uh, an example of how rangers view this, Roger Hicklick, who's the uh, patrol sergeant from Kugluktuk, you know, he gave us a really good story that I think really does capture well what we mean by indigenous resilience, you know. He says, we have people in the patrol who are very good and some who need more experience. Some have forgotten how to build an igloo. You need to save the, you need, you need to give the rangers a hard time sometimes, make them practice in weather or land they're not used to, make them lead the patrol in bad weather. The people with a lot of time on the land train those who don't have as much. 
Our young fellows know how to travel the land, but sometimes they don't know how to do it over long distances. I trained them to listen to me. I put them through hard times. In a blizzard, I told Ranger he had to lead now. It's up to him. This teaches them to travel safely. When the Ranger did this in the blizzard, he came back and told me, oh, I feel good. Only way for them to learn is to make them lead. It can't be the same people all the time. Everyone, men and ladies, have to lead. We use our GPS all the time and it helps, but we have to rely on our traditional knowledge. Um, so again, he gives them a, a bit of a hard time so they can learn that knowledge and pass it along to others. So just to end here, another, the last category we kind of apply to the Rangers, uh, the Ranger organization is an individual resilience. And I'm gonna let Whitney kind of talk more about this during the, uh, uh, the moderation period, because this was his kind of, um, he developed this idea of actually tying the Rangers into the Arctic social indicators. And these are indicators that have been developed to kind of talk about individual health and well-being, uh, particularly in the Arctic, and they kind of encapsulate health, material well-being, education, cultural being, and cultural vitality, contact with nature, and fate control. And certainly the Ranger Patrols are a platform to foster all of these things. Um, just a couple of examples, education, right? Lifelong learning, that's what Ranger Patrols are all about, both through the transmission of knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge, but also through the passing along of, of actual um, new skills from the uh, Ranger instructors. And of course, Ranger Patrols also do instill, as we've already heard from one of our Rangers, confidence and pride, uh, which are key elements of individual resilience, according to the Arctic Social Indicators. So thank you for that. Uh, I hope I didn't go too far past 10 minutes in that very quick introduction to resilience. Very much look forward to our conversations moving forward today um, and uh, hearing your thoughts on this framework as it applies to the Rangers. Thanks for your time. So, yes. So hi everyone. So first, uh, many thanks for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, NADS ID series. Uh, so to quickly introduce myself, and uh, as said earlier, I am currently working as a postdoc in the NADS. And I'm also a researcher at the OPSA and at the French Laboratory of CEARC. I've been working on Arctic subregions and Arctic security issues since 2013, and I've been working with Canadian Rangers for uh, the last uh, six years. Since my PhD was about relationships between military and Inuit communities in uh, Canadian Arctic. I conducted an inductive analysis of Canadian Rangers patrols, and for this research, I conducted uh, field work in um, Nunavut. But I especially conducted field work and interviews with Rangers and Rangers instructors from Nunavik. So my experience reflects more Canadian Rangers patrols from Nunavik and two CRPG than those from Nunavut and one CRPG, as uh, in Whitney and Peter's work. I think um, it's important to underline this because there is a distinctive uh, difference between two CRPG and one CRPG. And um, according to me, one of the most uh, important uh, difference, if, if not the most important, is the fact that Rangers instructors are um, full-time reservists in two CRPG, whereas Rangers instructors are part of the regular forces in one CRPG. So um, that being underlined, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting and important work that it's been doing in the uh, disaster uh, resilience uh, framework. And um, results underlined here um, echo well with some of the PhD results, of my PhD results. And there are several parallels that I've um, been, uh, yeah, it's okay yeah, with the PowerPoint, don't worry. Yeah, it's running by itself, yeah. Um, so there are several parallels that I drew while uh, reading uh, Peter's article and uh, Whitney and Peter's report. And um, more precisely, in the resilience framework developed in the report and article resonates with the agency theory that I mobilized uh, in my PhD. And um, I didn't work on uh, disaster management per se, but I think that this really highlights the beneficial uh, aspect of the Canadian Rangers patrols for uh, communities. Um, so very briefly, um, agency is the human capacity to intentionally influence the course of one's lives and actions. 
as well as to influence others, collective action systems, or the social and natural space. So thus, everyone can be a proactive agent with auto-organizational and auto-regulative capacities. And so as reservists, uh, rangers choose to be part of a patrol and they join to help their community and to help their youth with the Junior Canadian Rangers program. And thus they are active actors and responsible for their community's patrol. So rooted in communities, Canadian Rangers patrols are very much a proof of and a tool for the strengthening of Inuit and Indigenous agency. Hence, I very much agree about how the Canadian Rangers patrols are a suited and appropriate tool of personal and community empowerment for Inuit and Inuit communities and as such a source of individual, collective, cultural, indigenous, and community resilience. Um, for the sake of discussion, I do, however, want to open the discussion and, uh, about the maritime rule of Canadian Rangers patrols. And so I, I read in uh, this article and the reports that while um, Dr. Lackenborough emphasized that, and I quote, uh, the argument that the government should give the Canadian Rangers a maritime role in the Arctic overlook an obvious and important fact. Rangers already operate in the maritime domain by boats in summer and by snowmobile in winter. And um, Dr. Kikot advocated for more involvement of Canadian Rangers for mass recruit operations or mass casualty events and particularly for those patrols situated, located on the Northwest Passage, so particularly for patrols from the one CRPG. And so, yes, I do agree that Canadian Rangers have their own boats and uh, these are suited for climates and for their needs. And moreover, that Inuit people is historically and culturally a coastal people, living near Arctic coast and heavily relying on marine mammals and fish. But in some of the interviews that I conducted, and this is also reflected in uh, the reports and article, rangers said that they want to and should have more training in marine search and rescue. So I think this shows that they want to help more and they are in demand. And moreover, in the reports, um, there is a quote underlying that rangers will go help and rescue people no matter what. So with or without activation of their patrols for a maritime search and rescue with or without specific training. However, um, if there is like a mass maritime disasters, uh, I am wondering about the ability of Canadian Rangers private boats to uh, help rescue, for example, a sinking ship, ship of 100 or 1000 tourists. And I mean, there has been recently a very tragic accident last month about a ranger from Natashquan, so it's at Bascot now in Quebec who actually, yeah, he reportedly died saving his grandson because there were not enough room for the both of them in uh, the boat that came to rescue them. So yes, Canadian Rangers have boats and already operate in the maritime domain, but maybe there could be room for improvement or at the very least like room for discussion today. Um, what would be the solution to improve the involvement of Canadian Rangers for mass marine disasters? Is it technically or humanly possible? And also, could we put that responsibility, like mental wealth and mental resilience on the rangers? Um, so yeah, so this is a maybe tricky questions, but I was really wondering uh, about them when I was reading uh, the report and the articles. So thank you very much. That would be all for me uh, for now. And I will now let the screen to Bianca. Uh, hello, so I do not have a slideshow because I don't like making them, to be honest with you all. <laughs> I find them difficult. Okay, so um, you have to look at me, I guess. So first, I just want to say thank you to Shannon, Peter, Whitney, and Magdalene for being part of this conversation and for everybody else that's um, listening in, and also for being integral to my own research. Um, what I really love about our little group of ranger academics is that we come to our collective research from very different theoretical and methodological backgrounds. So as an anthropologist in training, I have the extreme privilege of having the opportunity to work directly at one CRPG in Yellowknife for an extended fieldwork period. So I'll be here for about two to three years. Um, this approach has allowed me to engage with and then theorize the nuanced and everyday experiences that happen at one CRPG. Specifically, 
Being immersed at once JPG allows me to examine the effective relationships that emerge from the cross-cultural interactions between rangers and ranger instructors, or RIs. Um, overall, in my own research, one of my central questions uh, examines the shifting role of militarization and bureaucratization within one CRPG and the effects of that. I'm really inter interested in thinking about how due to a variety of external factors that uh, almost everybody else has already sort of touched on with climate change, tourism, various industries, along with internal factors, so the rapid turnaround of leadership and shifting ideologies on both militarism and Canadian nationalism in the North, there has been a push um, to grow the ranger role and take on more responsibility. So I'm interested in thinking about alongside these shifts, what are the changes that are coming out of one CBG that are logistic and bureaucratic as they as one CBG, the headquarters tries to adapt to these external and internal factors. So my research aim um, is to examine how these changes affect patrols. So in keeping with the theme of today's conversation, um, the effect these changes have on the resiliency of patrols and on the individuals. So for one RI I spoke with, uh, who's just finishing up four years at the unit, um, he saw having community resiliency as having a range of, um, in a range of patrol is about, and I quote, uh, paying into the military ethos, the unit and the mission, right? And I think Peter talked about that a lot uh, in, his, in his slide, you can see the connection there. So um, when rangers can buy into these things, for him, it translates into a strong working patrol. So for this specific RI, it is having a strong working patrol that creates a sense of honor and pride, which he sees as the cornerstone for community, individual, and even psychological resiliency. This pride also comes from the patrol's ability to pass down knowledge and skills accrued from generations of living on the land while also gaining new ones. So furthermore, having rangers in communities gives the community the confidence that they can make it through disasters because they know that they're trained and ready. Therefore, I see the ranger patrols as having a dual functions in terms of resiliency. One, they give communities space and resources, which is critical, to continue traditional practices and gain new skills, be it subsidence food gathering or language skills or learning GPS navigation but also they allow communities to feel as though, yes, we have the ability, skills, and resources to keep the community safe and prospering. Therefore, while a lot, I'm sorry, that was a quote from a ranger that I spoke with. Uh, therefore, while a lot of the examples we hear about when we think about resiliency deal with like search and rescue, natural disasters, sort of the physical things that ranger patrols do, what many rangers and even our eyes who worked long-term with um, patrols, often cite the sort of emotional and psychological support that patro patrols provide the larger community. So due to my location at one CRPG, I work very closely with ranger instructors. And so in reading the report, which I hope um, everybody has access to at some point uh, and listening to um, everyone else speak, I often find myself coming back to the idea of what is the, what is the role that ranger instructors have in this resiliency conversation? And so while I definitely think this question is maybe outside the scope of the report, um, I am left thinking about how the RIs at one JPG teach and interact with rangers over their three year uh, contracts and how these sort of effective and interpersonal interactions have a major role in both the effectiveness and the resiliency of a patrol. So in both the sense of what the patrol is physically capable of doing. Um, so what Meg Lee was saying about like the search and rescue and then also at the the moral, emotional, and psychological well-being of a patrol and the community. So as the only regular force RIs and all the CR, um, CRPGs, all the sergeants, predominantly sergeants, uh, are posted to Yellowknife with, come from very long military careers. So many of them have upwards of 15, 20, 25 years in by the time they get to one CRPG. And they come from all over the country. Many of them have little or no experience working with rangers or indigenous peoples more largely. They're also the only RIs who are posted to the CRPGs and don't apply and are selected for the position. We can complicate this a little bit because many of the RIs actually do ask for this posting, but some of them are just put here in a good way. Um, after working with and interviewing many of the RIs at one CRPG, 
I examine how they come to the unit with very specific preconceived ideas about indigenous peoples, the North and Rangers, and how these ideas influence the type of relationships they foster with Rangers. So while our eyes are almost exclusively uh, combat armed trained sergeants, and many of them are considered experts in navigation, weapon handling, um, shelter building, um, they don't receive any formal training to be instructors specifically, meaning that they do not receive education on the cultural, geographical, social, political specifics of the North or the communities they enter. Uh, each RI will have six to eight patrols that, they're, that they are, that they administer and up to up 12 because they get shifted around um, over their time here. Um, Oh no. Okay. Uh, instead, much of the training is passed down between our eyes, where incoming our eyes travel with current our eyes to communities for their first two patrols. This creates a sort of like genealogy of knowledge, a lineage of knowledge in how our eyes learn about the North and the methods they employ as our eyes. In discussing this lessons learned approach to leadership, one our eye explained how whenever he takes out a new RI on the land, he says he repeatedly emphasizes how the quote, the only way to make being a ranger work is to accept the ranger way. And while my specific research um, examines how the repeatedly and rapidly changing leadership at one CBG and this passed down approach to knowledge production about rangers, so from the like literal sergeants all the way up to getting shifted to the div, under the div command, um, influences how one CRPG is logistically and bureaucratically formed. I also believe this is really critical to the role of resiliency in patrols. <coughs> Sorry, I just came back from BC, made of COVID. <gasps> During my time at Once Your VG, I have started to think about um, our eyes in two ways. Um, so the first, and I, I, we can complicate this a little bit more in like the question answer, and uh, this is something that me and Whitney have, uh, and even me and Megan have talked about a couple times, but I see the, this one group of rangers coming to the unit, or, or they're taught by their eyes in this lessons learned sort of method of passing down knowledge with an idealized idea of rangers, right? This type of RI usually thinks patrols should have little to no military interference, so they should not be militarized, and that the rangers should strictly rely on traditional knowledge and methods in their patrols. On the other hand, some RIs come or are taught at one CRPG with the idea that uh, RIs and then largely the headquarters are meant to somehow fix or militarize patrols in order to make them max efficient within a military model and then in terms of the search and everything should follow the search and rescue, all these things should follow this very militarized model. And so while I don't pray to condone either method or and acknowledge like the long and very complicated history of settled colonialism that shapes both of these ideas, I'm interested in thinking about the different ways that these types of RIs become enablers or hinders of resiliency in the communities that they work with. Um, so in my own research, I'm very interested in thinking about this like top-down militarization and bureaucratization uh, at one CRPG and the sort of the administrative changes that the unit undergoes and has undergone the last 15, 10 years that makes this ranger way increasingly difficult and complicated to achieve. Um, and it becomes increasingly the role of RIs to tow this middle line of adapting the changes as they are pushed down the chain of command, uh, a, a rapidly changing chain of command, while also adapting their own military style and leadership to this ranger way. Because once again, a lot of these sergeants are coming from a very, very traditional military background and a very traditional military leadership background. So for example, while increasing the clothing allotment, um, so uh, rangers now have a lot more uh, clothing from just their red hoodie or their cap they had back in the day. Um, it helps them feel a sense of pride in their uniform and makes the patrols across the Canada feel more united. The removal, for example, of the traditional day from one CRPG has caused a lot of disappointment in some patrols. Both of these things are a result of this top-down bureaucratization and have a direct effect on resiliency. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think Meg, the work that I've read of Meg Deleese speaks much clearer and more coherently than I ever could to this, but many RIs, even for me, and she cites this a lot, describe um, being able to be an effective RI when they are assimilated into the Ranger way. And I'm interested, um, just to end, in thinking about the tension that is created between this assimilation and what I'm calling this bureaucratization uh, and the short-term and long-term effects this has on patrols, especially because at least specifically at one CRPG, um, patrols don't have this 
three year turnaround the headquarters has, right? They have a long history of corporate knowledge about what the Rangers are and what the Rangers were and what the Rangers could be. And that doesn't necessarily exist at the headquarters level or within the RIs. And that's the end. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks to all of you. And I have a long list of questions, but others are feeding them in too. So I won't, I'll uh, resist the temptation to ask them all myself. Uh, a couple though, that I think naturally emerge from your conversations. Uh, Peter Megali was asking you about the maritime patrols. And I don't know if you have any reflections on whether or not the investment in ranger capacity is the, should be the primary focus or some of your writings where you've talked about the rangers and where they fit within a broader whole of society and interact with Coast Guard Auxiliary and Guardians programs and that. And then following that, Meg Ali, I'd love to hear your reflections on Bianca's observations about what she is seeing as the militarization of one CRPG and some of those narratives from ranger instructors seeing the rangers as benefiting from becoming more military. I mean, that's a very different observation than you have published, Meg Ali, about the reverse assimilation, where it typically is the ranger instructors in 2CRPG being assimilated into the ranger way. So just love some of your thoughts on that as well. And, uh, and just for clarification for the group, so the report that Meg Ali and Bianca referred to is a long 176 page report on how we measure success of the Rangers in one CRPG that Pete and I have written. And right now we're socializing with the patrol group and some Rangers and experts like Bianca and Mega Lee to get feedback. And unlike the typical academic approach, which is you write your report, you put it out there and then you get feedback. We think given that the information is actually supposed to be reflective of what the Rangers have shared with us, we want the report process to also be reflective of it. So it will eventually come out, we hope on the Minds website, if the unit and the Rangers consent to it. Um, so sorry, it wasn't available before this talk, but we want to make sure that the, the primary stakeholders have first access. So I digress. Pete, please, your thoughts, and then Meg Lee. Yeah, Meg Lee, thanks for those comments about the, uh, the Ranger role kind of in the maritime sphere. So just to, just to preface this, you know, there's been a long, uh, last few years have brought quite a few calls for the Rangers to be given a bigger maritime role. At one point, the idea of having, you know, uh, maritime rangers, you know, was kind of batted around in some media circles and by some prominent kind of um, Arctic security speakers. Pierre LeBlanc, for instance, has quite frequently said the rangers need to have a bigger maritime role. Certainly, the, mar the rangers already have, you know, a maritime role. They're using their boats to go on patrol quite frequently, uh, to go from point A to point B quite frequently. Uh, they're doing all types of activity on the ice, right? We often kind of don't think of that as a maritime, it should be considered as such. Um, so they're, they're, they already have quite a maritime role. So I'm not advocating that they be given the tasks that are currently being given to the Coast Guard Auxiliary, right? We have an Arctic Coast Guard Auxiliary that is kind of growing quite rapidly, which is a great thing, a new resource for the community. Uh, I think that where we're talking about the Ranger role in possible mass rescue operations is coming out of conversation with Rangers along the Northwest Passage who say, you know, we're going to go out anyways. That's just what we do. We're going to go try and do our best to help these people. So what are some of the ways that the organization, the training of a Ranger Patrol might be leveraged in the broader response to a mass rescue operation? So, I mean, Rangers are not going to be the lead on responding to a mass rescue operation, but certainly they've expressed a lot of ways in which they could help in that kind of uh, situation. So if a, a, an adventure cruise ship were to run aground near one of their communities and have to be offloaded, the Rangers could play a role in saying, hey, this is a good place to offload. This is a safe place to actually offload passengers. They could help with things like shoreline searches if passengers go missing. They should be. They could be a point of contact between the evacuees and community members. Um, they could assist with, um, uh, you know, setting up temporary camps to keep people warm. So there's all these different kind of smaller roles that could occur within a mass rescue operation that could be incredibly useful. But you're right to say, right, the Rangers aren't going to be the lead organization, the lead agency responding to a mass rescue operation. But certainly, there's ways that they could be helped. Uh, and I'd love to talk more about the Ranger role in mass rescues and mass casualty events. If there's any more questions on that, please just send them in because it's one that's it's a pretty fascinating topic. Um, while we're at it, I think it's just important to emphasize, and I saw a couple of questions pop up on the Zoom chat um, asking about, you know, where do the Rangers actually fit in in the emergency response, emergency management, disaster management responses? And I think it is really essential to, to really highlight, right, that they're doing so as part of a whole of society approach, right? I mean, sometimes the Rangers are the lead. And again, when we're looking at groups like 3K Ranger Patrol Group in Northern Ontario, 
right? They're quite engaged in search and rescue. I mean, they, they have a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the OPP that they're gonna be kind of the primary responders there. And they're very active in community evacuations, flood watch, fire watch, because in those communities, they're, they're really the go-to organization. There's not a lot of other uh, organizations at the community level that can do what the rangers do. In other contexts, you know, I'm thinking in particular, there's volunteer search and rescue, there's Coast Guard, Auxiliary, there's lots of other different agencies, Inuit Guardians, there's lots of groups that might be involved in emergency response that rangers would have to work with. So one of the big things coming out of our is whether it be for a mass rescue operation or for you know, a large search and rescue, rangers have to be able to work horizontally with the different groups that are at a community, Coast Guard Auxiliary, right, again, volunteer, GSAR, whatever it might be, they have to be able to work horizontally with these groups to, to, to provide the most effective whole of society response. Probably more questions on that coming in, and I'd love to chat about, about that a bit more, but uh, I know Whitney had passed a question on to Megley as well, so. Yes, thank you very much, Peter, for your answer. Um, so to react on uh, Bianca's, uh, what was, uh, Bianca's was saying is that the, the huge difference between Bianca's work and uh, the results that I get is really, um, I think, and she already told that, that the things that in 2COPG uh, rangers instructors are reservists. So they are here primarily because they want to work with indigenous uh, people. Uh, so Inuits, First Nations, and Métis. So they are here to uh, to have these intercultural uh, um, relationships. And I think this is the main difference between uh, one CRPG and two CRPG. The willingness to work with indigenous peoples. And um, also, um, we can see in the past, and uh, Whitney, you, you, you wrote a lot about this also, it's like, um, in order for a patrol to work, you need to have a, a real respect for indigenous culture. Otherwise, rangers will just stop uh, showing up at the trainings. So I think, yes, you, you, need, you need to have military training to be able to uh, work with other uh, rescue agencies, for example. So, and you need to have trainings with the uh, GPS because uh, most of the elder rangers don't know are, are not um, you know, comfortable uh, as uh, the junior ones to work with uh, technology. But um, for me, the most important um, aspect of the Canadian Rangers is the cultural and indigenous uh, knowledge that they have. So I don't have uh, yes or no questions to, 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 to the yes or no answer, sorry, to Bianca's questions. But yeah, I think that the main difference is uh, I worked with uh, reservist, uh, in rangers instructors reservist at two COPG and Bianca is working with uh, regular forces, military guys at one COPG. So I, I guess that this is the real big differences between uh, the results and the discussions that we had. Thanks, so thanks for your questions coming in as well. I'm gonna change up the order. So we have a wonderful one. And Andy, do you wanna pose your question? I think it's an interesting segue from what Meg Ali just responded and Bianca's comment about militarization and institutions and bureaucratization. So Andy Chater, I invite you to, to ask your question. Yeah, no, thanks very much for a very interesting um, event today. Uh, my question is, is there a tension in using the Canadian Rangers to build indigenous resilience and reconciliation in what is fundamentally a colonial institution, by which I refer to the Canadian military? Thanks. Did you want me to answer that? <laughs> well, it'd be a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, the tension, um, the tension between between the communities and the military, or the tension within communities. Um, it could be either. It could be both. I meant sort of tension more generally. So I've actually, um, when I first sort of started thinking about uh, one CRPG, this was probably like one of like the main questions that I was also um, thinking about. And it's, it's really hard to answer because um, th there's so many communities that have such a different relationship to the state, in my opinion, that, uh, I don't know, I think Whitney maybe has a longer history of like working in like a variety of communities. Um, 
but even just like the difference between like communities that are below the tree line and above the tree line and their relationship to like colonialism in general is like radically different and then I also think that there's a very different and I don't want to speak for like rangers like I like I'm, I'm very like confident like that's not my job but I think that they have a very different relation like to them like they the the rangers is maybe seen in terms of even as resiliency thing as a, as a more like encompassing community thing I don't know I don't know am I, I don't know if I'm messing this up sorry Whitney <laughs> oh and playing I mean think, playing on this idea I think another way uh Dr. Shader think about your it's a great question it's a big challenge it is a very challenging one Bianca to, to wrestle with and I've thought about it a ton over the last two decades partly I'd say it's precisely because the military is often held up as the ultimate colonial institution that the very fact that we have rangers as an enduring long-term relationship that meets so many of the criteria that Peter identified in terms of community resilience is exactly why it's so important to be potentially at the vanguard of some of the aspects of reconciliation in practice or mutual understanding. And in a way, I'd suggest if this can happen in a military context, in what is often depicted as the most colonial of institutions, what's the excuse in other institutions of government to not be able to have healthy, positive, mutually reinforcing trust-based relationships like the Rangers and bodies? So in essence, I almost turn it around and often think about it as this is exactly where we should be looking for reconciliation. These are exactly the types of models that can inspire us going forward. It would, we're not in a post-colonial moment. We can have huge debates about that if you want, but we're not post-colonial. We still are enduring and, and grappling with legacies and realities of colonialism. Understanding then that some of these colonial institutions can be better. They can still be sites of reconciliation. They can be sites of supporting empowerment in the language that Peter used and we've all used in terms of agency and negative. It's, it's not disempowering people by assisting them to be empowered. In fact, I, I have a very different worldview as a parent and as a human being about saying mutual support is exactly what we're looking for here. And the Rangers is not gonna be the panacea. It's not gonna answer everything. It can't address every, uh, every challenge facing communities. It, it's not perfect in the way it's expressed in every patrol. There are gonna be huge differences in terms of leadership capacity or desires for certain forms of engagement, but all that is the beauty of the diversity that makes up Canada. And I still think the fact that we have a military that I've described in the past as in the Rangers at least, representing a lot of the postmodern forms of what things could take, there's something exciting there for me. And it's one of the things that drew me to the Rangers in the first place and has kept me there ever since, that if all of our theories are built upon oppositional models and that reconciliation is something that has not been done and is only something we can do going into the future, I think we're missing some of these important stories like the Rangers that actually maybe show us what has happened understand why it happens and why it works, and then take some of those lessons and apply them in diverse settings. Um, but enough from me, Scott McDonald, would love to turn over the question because I think you have a natural bridge to tie this to, to the youth component. Uh, thanks very much, Whitney. Um, my question is, what do you see as the key role of the Rangers in helping the JCRs become more resilient? Uh, in my experience, as youth become more resilient, so do communities. Thanks very much. Meg Ali, I know you did quite a bit of work on the JCRs as well when you were looking at your agency theory and your dissertation and in some of your subsequent writings. Would you like to? Um, this yes, yes, yes. Because, yeah, in my PhD, I defended thesis that Canadian Rangers patrols help strengthen human security of um, Inuit uh, Canadian Arctic uh, security um, communities. Sorry. And um, well, they help um, Junior to become more resilient with uh, different tools. Uh, so they are pushing them to go out on the land like fishing and hunting. So I guess this is a really huge part of uh, the indigenous resilience to, to know um, how to hunt, how to fish and to know their environment. Um, there are also the, big, the FACE program, so, which is the Prevention for Harassment and uh, Sexual Abuse uh, program is really huge for the community. And one ranger actually told me that um, this, was, this program is the only one working uh, in Nunavik. And it was the first program really speaking with uh, drug abuse and sexual harassment with junior rangers. 
and I guess that this is a huge, um, huge, yeah, it's a really important program for Inuit communities since there are a lot of social issues with uh, that kind of drugs abuse and harassment. And by forcing them to talk to each other and to also to call a bunch of numbers if they are feeling down and, uh, and they need help and they need someone to talk to. Um, I think some of, I, I don't have the numbers and I'm really not good at numbers, but um, lots of ranchers instructors told me that the suicide rates um, decrease for uh, the last years because our, thanks to our, with the, this, this tool of junior rangers program. So I'm not saying that this is the only program for um, Inuit uh, and Nunavik communities, but I guess that this is a cornerstone of, you know, to help the youth uh, dealing with their um, daily issues, I guess. And to just to, to add a couple of points with the, the last questions, and uh, I just wanted to say that in, in their interviews, some ranchers and trucks told me that before joining uh, to CRPG, uh, they didn't know the differences between Metis, First Nations, and Inuit people. And I mean, I think you can't have an effective uh, reconciliation if you don't, if you're not able to tell the differences between the three main indigenous peoples uh, in your country. But I guess I'm not Canadian, so <laughs> yeah. It's a great, the great set of points. Uh, Peter Bianca, if either of you want to weigh in on the JCR question, I think Scott, it's a great one and, and Mega Lee, you've done a great job of helping to formulate it. I think the, the relative attention given to the JCR program and its elevation to really being considered one of the core missions of the range, one of the core tasks is to perform that mentorship role is telling in and of itself. And one of my favorite anecdotes uh, comes from Sergeant Peter Moon, who's been the longstanding public affairs ranger in uh, three CRPG in Northern Ontario, who got me, really encouraged me early on to say, wrap your head around Whitney. The fact that we're entering into Anishinaabek Cree, Oja Cree communities who are living the transgenerational trauma associated with residential schools and all the, the dysfunction and other things that flow from that, willing to send their young people down to a centralized camp down in Geraldton, led by rangers, entrusting their children with the military, to play on that theme of the previous question, entrusting them to go down and believing that those kids are in great hands, they're not only going to have their cultural sense of, of value and worth affirmed, they're going to build confidence and we trust that they're going to be treated properly with respect and come back better people. And I mean, that was just a moment to me that blew my mind to say, sometimes in the most unexpected places, you find relationships forming, but that relationship is entirely predicated on a healthy relationship between rangers and their host community, their home community. The JCRs flow from that and leverage it. So it's this wonderful package. And I think the amplification of the JCR program, not a subcomponent of reserves, we don't child soldiers in Canada, right? This is a standalone piece, but that plugs into all this capacity that exists in the military through these ranger relationships to actually build. And the fact that communities are seeing that as the key priority for ranger growth in the organization is often JCR related. To me, it's such a ringing endorsement, not only the JCR program, but also of the rangers who are obviously key to sustaining it. And all those junior Canadian ranger instructors who get it, who are going in and fostering it and sustaining this environment of mutual respect and trust. To me, it's just such an incredible story. And Meg Ali, you talk about the declining suicide rates and other variables. The sad thing I found, there was a, an article in Le Soleil magazine back in 1996, I think, calling the JCRs an antidote suicide, an antidote suicide, not antidote, sorry, an antidote, a correction to it. Sad thing is we don't have statistics. And for so much of what we're working on, it's very impressionistic at this point, and one of the things that we're finding is, how do you come up with indicators that will allow us to have a more robust set of data? Not, not overly complicated stuff, but just some basic data to say, this is not just anecdotal. This is, this is demonstrable to decision makers to say, these are things worth investing more in, as long as you're investing in the right kind of ways, because it has brought tangible results and makes for a better Canada. Pete, over to you. Yeah, well, thanks, Whitney. I mean, you said it so eloquently. I'm just going to add a couple of things. Uh, I think just in our conversations, 
a lot of the Rangers in one CRPG, the emphasis they placed on their activities with JCRs is incredible. The time they invest in working with the JCRs is incredible. They clearly see it as one of their defining roles, which is great because, I mean, it fits within this, this resilience framework. Strong, healthy communities, strong, healthy individuals need that kind of ongoing learning, that kind of ongoing engagement from an early age. And the JCR, you know, they, they provide that. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, also, a really important practical uh, from, from an emergency management side, even very practical impact. So the, the, the Ranger Patrol in Kuglaktuk, for instance, focuses on, and I know a lot of other patrols do this as well, but focuses on preparing the JCRs to go out in the land. What do you need to be out there? You know, how, do you, how, do you, how can you survive out there? What do you need to bring with you? But beyond that, also, you know, as kids, they teach them to you know, watch your uncles as they go out in the land. Watch what they're taking with them. Watch their tracks. Know where they go so that if there's ever a search and rescue, you can report back to ground search and rescue or the Rangers, you know, what's going on. I mean, that kind of resilience building from the emergency side, the search and rescue side, is an incredible value added through the JCR programs. I think that's great. I also want, again, just to touch on a bit on, on the, the suicide prevention aspect of the JCRs. Um, really interesting case in, in 3CRPG in Northern Ontario, where rangers were actually deployed, officially activated and deployed to, to various communities on suicide prevention duty, where they would actually you know, walk around the streets and kind of monitor things and help out where they could and provide, you know, learning activities and kind of on the land activities to, to help those communities out. So that's a really great example, I think, of a very tangible way in which uh, rangers are not just impacting JCRs, but youth more broadly. And just finally, one last thing during the COVID-19 response, I just want to highlight the role that rangers in every patrol group have played in monitoring the mental health of JCRs. That's been one of their one of their taskings that they've done across the board is checking in with the youth, checking in with the JCRs, making sure that, uh, or maybe not making sure, but just checking in. I think that's a really important part, checking in on their mental health during this kind of unprecedented crisis. So, thanks. Bianca, do you have any reflections on JCR you'd like to share? Um, I don't like really work with JCRs or like the JCR side of one chain that much, but I, I definitely think it's like it's like a big part of even one two BG that the the instructors and in the communities really focus like you know when the are when the when the patrols go out they often try to incorporate JCR stuff into it and they're always trying to get um like it like kind of coinciding when they when they do things and I I think that's like an interesting way like it's also just like part of this like community right it's not like the rangers are one thing and then the JCRs it is very integrated. Um, which I think is what maybe made you make that comment about the child soldiers, because I think a lot of people, like, they think that there isn't, that there, there's, like, I, it's a really thick black line. Like, there's not any gray area between, like, these are, like, it's really, like, it's a dark line that, like, everybody's repeatedly, like, drawing over. Um, but I think because it's, it's, it's about the community, and so they do integrate them together, not because they're trying to make child soldiers, but because they're 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 so interlinked in in the in the community resiliency and community building aspect of it, not in the military aspect of it. That's what I've that's what I've like seen. I don't really spend a lot of Thanks, time. Very, wonderfully no, wonderfully put. And I think that's really helpful to even I'm gonna use that phrase about drawing a really dark line there where that's understood even within the separate companies and different constructs depending on the patrol group, the way that that's actually uh, coordinated. Um, I'm going to turn to Troy Buffard. You have a, a specific question, and then I'll turn it over immediately to Derek uh, Moss as well for a question. And, uh, and maybe even if we just hear the two questions together, that will give you time to, to all respond to both of them. So, Troy. Thank you, Whitney, and thank you for this presentation. This is wonderful, uh, and it, it has special meaning um, as I, I do some work uh, with DOD. In fact, this week I had another uh, session with officials across the nation. And this helps me to explain uh, Canada, Canadian Ranger roles and operational um, responsibilities in the North and it's received very well. Uh, so thank you for this. Um, this is important information. My question is, is the, uh, I would like to know what are, what are the Canadian Rangers uh, roles when it comes to interagency uh, responsibilities such as when the, the RCMP might be deployed to communities and there's an expectation for support. Uh, is there a formal role uh, for Canadian Rangers? Are there, are there aspects of other interagency uh, interactions that uh, are, work particularly well or are problematic uh, that you might have suggestions about? 
And Derek, do you want to ask your question as well? And then the different panelists, because we're getting close to time, we'll have a chance to sort of reflect on all of them. Is that okay? Sure, that's wonderful. I'll, I'll try and make it quick and shamelessly. I'm, I'm going to use my question to add a couple of comments before I actually ask the question. I apologize for that. Um, just just a, a shout out to the Canadian Armed Forces in general, in addition to the JCR program, which is absolutely spectacular. Um, we shouldn't also forget the um, what the Reg Force does to help um, Indigenous youth, particularly with programs like Raven, uh, Bold Eagle, and, and, and Black Bear. Raven in particular, concentrating on the north of 60 youth. So three, three other great programs. Um, and, and if I can circle back to the, the talk about um, colonialism, um, much like um, whether it's the North or the you know, Ranger patrols in general are not homogenous, I, I would I would offer that their view of the Crown is also not homogenous, um, and it also depends on what department you're talking about. So they would have a very different view, um, not to put words in Indigenous people's mouths, but a very different view of the Coast Guard as a department, as you know, the Department of National Defense or the Canadian Armed Forces, and then compare that to, to the RCMP or INAC, very, very different views across the board. Um, so the question pertains uh, to ranger instructors. So maybe Bianca, um, you, know, I'll, you know, I'll let Whitney decide, but um, you know, I kind of got this from some of your comments. Um, it, it can be tough being a ranger instructor. Um, so you're going off on your own into a community where, as you say, you haven't had a lot of training on the cultural aspects. Um, and, and, you know, they see and experience things that are very different to probably the way they've been, they've been brought up. Um, you know, has, I know that there was a proposed initiative um, around 2013, 2014. Um, you know, I, I, Jeff Allen spearheaded that, um, but I don't know if it went anywhere. Has there been any resiliency program or initiative specifically implemented for ranger instructors? So Bianca, do you want to take that one, Mega Lee? I'd love for you to follow up on that and maybe reflect on both Derek's question and Troy's question. And then Peter, if you could follow up with Troy's question. Thanks, Derek. Great. So uh, at one CRPG, so I, I like work very specifically just with one CRPG. Uh, no, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I think one CRPG specifically relies very heavily on Whitney to do a lot of the like sort of cultural training when he does his like yearly, um, you do the, the, the training day at the beginning of September, whatever it's called. I think that that's very, uh, even when I got there, they, everyone printed off all of Whitney's slideshows. I'm like, this is what we learned. And they like, that's what they gave me. And I was like, cool, right? So I think that they have a, a huge advantage in the sense that they have Whitney there. And so um, in, in terms of like what they learn about um, the North, uh, in terms of resiliency and like initiatives, no, not, not at least not that I've seen or heard of or even heard like whisperings of or even even heard desires of like I don't the are like the RIs don't really seem to, like they don't advocate for like they don't ask for it um they they do um have very a lot of them have very close bonds with each other and as I said they go out on patrols as partners and then they almost do like like a fraternity sorority like big brother big sister like little little big little you know if you've been a sorority kind of relationship where like that's sort of their person that they go to in helping to um figure out a lot of a problem that they like sort of come up with later on uh and then uh a lot of times if there's too many people in a patrol they'll go out in pairs so they're actually not on the land by themselves all the time they off they actually do go out in pairs especially when they're doing uh, anything with weapons, like weapons training, they go out and- in the implementation. Yeah, so they actually do a lot of co-teaching, at least in the last couple of years, uh, which I think has really helped them in this, in this role of resiliency where they're able to see how other people do it. And there is a lot of like, they do like a lot of meetings where there's cross learning that they do. And I think that maybe fills in that role for them. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I can, I can add a little tiny bit just to say military family services has taken an interest and in using the MFRCs, so the military and family resource centers in the different areas and making sure that ranger instructors and their families can avail themselves of the services has been something articulated much more strongly in the last five years. 
the full extent of Major Allen's initiative, no, was not implemented. One can also look at the last paragraph in the DND Canadian Armed Forces Ombudsman's report on the Canadian Rangers. And it's interesting that report is very much focused on Rangers, but the last paragraph to me is very, very telling, emphasizing the importance of, of casting some light on some of those unique pressures that instructors face. And I, I think that that's something that within the different patrol groups, there's been efforts done individually by patrol groups to identify ways that they can provide the supports. But in terms of an overarching army wide, I think that's something that we may see coming and even the refinement of the language. So strong, secure, engaged commitment 108 to improve the training, to enhance the training and effectiveness of the Rangers, that language to me created the space to put much more investment, deliberate investment into Ranger instructors and supports for Ranger instructors, not just dedicating all of the attention into growing the Rangers in numbers. To me, that's really important. If Rangers are, as, as Megali and Bianca and Peter all said, this bridge between the military and communities, then it's really important that those Ranger instructors be healthy or else the whole health of the organization and relationship will, will suffer. Sorry, I said too much, Megali, over to you. Can I just say one more thing too? I will also say at least at one CRPG, um, there is an opportunity to, uh, to extend your contract out one or two years after your three years. And uh, everybody almost exclusively that I've spoken to who has left the three years or even up the four years has cited like burnout as part of the problem. Like either through their family, like their family just can't handle, you know, then now all of a sudden they have two, two, a two-year-old and a three-year-old at home and like the wife's working full time and they can't manage that but like burnout yeah what you're saying about like the family resources like their need they need it a lot because it it's they're gone two weeks of the month every month essentially and it, there there's a lot of burnout in in their job and i think that they talk about that a lot too sorry let's get megaline um yes so yeah i i don't know about any official uh uh initiatives but like whitney already talked about that but from what I heard in the interviews, um, Rangers instructors are kind of mentoring each other. There is like a, an elder Rangers instructors that will go on the field with a new one to, to help him or her, um, you know, get used to the community. But it is true that in the interviews, uh, lots of them talk about uh, the fact that they are uh, social workers. So like they need to deal with social issues, they need to deal with uh, children, and some are not prepared to do that. But um, others also said that the work that they were doing in the Canadian Rangers uh, patrols were actually kind of similar that the one that they were doing in Afghanistan in a peacekeeping operation. So it's really like, uh, help uh, civil society building up and find ways to, uh, to find solutions to uh, their social problems and stuff. And this is actually why, you know, I started my PhD thinking I will be working on civil military um, relationships. And since in my interviews, I had a lot of uh, data pointing, pointed on social issues and uh, the need to help communities. This is why my PhD uh, is on human security and on not on civil military operations and civil military um, relationships. To answer to uh, the question of, of RCMP, I I don't have um, I don't think they have a formal role, but they are really essential to uh, build the liaise between the community and the young. Uh, or CMP officers that are usually pointed, uh, you know, in, in uh, they are, you know, posted in the north. And it's, it's usually their first appointment, and they also they are not, you know, ready or trained to uh, to deal with this intercultural, uh, really like um, difference. So rangers are here to uh, make sure that everything goes well, and. Uh, but I don't know any anything about the official role as like a liaison officer between the RCMP and the Rangers. So just touching on Troy's comment again, getting into that this idea of interagency cooperation and coordination. I think that I just want to highlight the Ranger patrols play an essential role in kind of facilitating the space between the, the federal, the provincial territorial level responses to an emergency or a disaster, 
and the community level responses. So ranger patrols are these really sophisticated networks of relationships. Uh, they know people in the community, they know almost everybody in the community oftentimes, and they wear a lot of different hats. You know, they're involved with a lot of different things. So when, for instance, there's a community evacuation, you know, rangers can tell responding agencies, hey, this is who's vulnerable, this is who needs assistance right away, this is who should be evacuated right away. So rangers, you know, from an interagency perspective are a really vital, um, they, they really provide a vital entry point into communities for responding agencies. So I think that's a really key role they play. Can it be strengthened? Absolutely. Uh, certain steps have been taken to strengthen that role. Um, lots of times, uh, you know, military exercises in the North are practicing uh, natural disaster response, um, community evacuations, this kinds of thing. So different ranger patrols do get experience with this, but certainly there could be you know, greater opportunities to practice these skill sets and to really establish these relationships a bit more strongly. Um, actually, Whitney and I were on a call the other day with rangers from 2CRPG who were talking about um, you know, the response to COVID-19 and how initially there was some, some issues with that between public health agencies and the rangers with the public health agencies not really understanding what rangers could and could not do so of course, to really have an efficient, timely response, it would be great if those roadblocks, those obstacles, those institutional silos can be broken down even a bit more to encourage even, even more cooperation across the board. Um, I think just also, again, focusing on this horizontal coordination piece, that's absolutely vital. And Rangers um, will at times have to work with different community groups, different uh, organizations, again, whether it be the Coast Guard Auxiliary or Voluntary GSAR. And sometimes that horizontal coordination coordination is difficult because it's not practiced. And even though rangers are multi-hatted and sometimes are members of all the organizations in the, in the community, that doesn't allow and facilitate for coordination all the time. So actually an idea that we've been kind of working on in addition to looking at the ranger role in community disaster resilience, is looking at the role that something like a community public safety officer might be able to play in some northern communities. And Troy, I think you'll be kind of familiar with the term we're using. It comes from the village public safety officer program. And so kind of what we're thinking is, it's a really good model. I know it has some issues in Alaska around the law enforcement side of it, but if you cut that out of it and focus on public safety, you focus on the role they play in coordinating responses to emergencies, the role they play in coordinating search and rescue, the role they play in fire. And I think in some Northern communities, that model might work well to facilitate the kind of coordination and interagency cooperation that we all know is essential in emergencies and disasters. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that and translating those models across borders. And I, I understand there's a big review going on of the VPSO program right now, and I know there's issues with it, but I think there's a model there that could really help with some of these coordination issues that we've been identifying today. Um, and the Rangers certainly have a role in that, but it would be great if there was a, a community level institution that could facilitate the quantum cooperation that is, is so essential during these emergencies and disasters. Right. Well, well right. thanks everyone. I think a lot of these questions will bring up ones of mandates which is a challenging one and, and can sometimes get kind of mundane because it gets into that administrative side of things, but it's ultimately real. At what level do you want to delegate or devolve uh, the agency or the empowerment to actually cross over mandates? And I think uh, command and control issues are very clear here as well with what we're playing with now. Troy, if I can play a little bit with it, it's, for example, Rangers, clearly search and rescue is not the same as body recovery. However, there's nothing to prevent rangers in an area where there's a need to recover a body from being asked to go out and do a surveillance patrol to an area where there's a need potentially to recover a body. That would not, it fits with the spirit of the law, it certainly fits with the letter of the law, and there are ways to work around it. So I guess the answer to your question, as everybody's answered more eloquently than I, is officially the RCMP is very different from the rangers, but in good patrols, where there's a real he or strong, healthy relationship at the community level, community resilience will have lines of communication between the RCMP and the Rangers. There are cases where even though it's not officially on the books, RCMP say, we don't go and take out our snowmobile very often. It's great if we give that to one of the Rangers who we know who doesn't have a snowmobile and their machine's being fixed to just go take it out and take it for a run and use it for an exercise. And it's awesome because it gets the the buildup of carbon out of our carburetor. And at the same time, the range, you got these wonderful stories about informal networks, which relates to a lot of what Pete was articulating theoretically in practice and not wanting to necessarily formalize some of the informal networks or informal relationships that work really well, know that they're there, not want to inhibit them, but at the same time, not end up breaking something that works in practice because you want to have everything looking really clear in terms of mandates. And it's a wonderful, uh, complicated problem set. Thank all of our panelists. 
um, for their insights. Thanks to all of you for your, your questions. We certainly love to hear more by email from any of you who have suggestions on where we take this. And like most good conversations, I see this just as a point of departure for a longer conversation. Uh, congrats to Peter. And thanks to Aaron and the team at, at Minds for uh, funding actually the four of us to work under Pete's leadership on a project looking at lessons observed and lessons learned from COVID-19 through a ranger lens. Um, so if any of you have suggestions or, or ideas about with whom we should connect or ideas of how to approach that, we, we certainly welcome it. Otherwise, Shannon, over to you to, uh, to wrap things up. Yes, thank you so much. So thank you to Whitney and Pete and Magalie and Bianca. Uh, very fascinating. And thank you as well to the participants. I felt that um, that was really great that we were able to incorporate so many of your questions and uh, that Whitney was able to lead us through that. So as Whitney said, please stay tuned. We, we do hope to have um, that report that he was referring to up uh, in due time. Uh, as well, we, we anticipate being able to post the PowerPoint presentations from today um, online. And we will also have um, uh, a report on this conversation that um, our graduate fellow Bianca and our postdoc Meg Lee are going to uh, put together for us. So, so please stay tuned to that and, and feel free to pass that along to anyone who was not able to make it today. Um, but just before uh, all of us depart today, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we have our next Nats and Ideas series queued up uh, for October. So this one will be on uh, the question, is it time for Canada to revisit missile defense participation? So we look forward that day to having uh, our Nats and co-lead Dr. Andrea Sharon uh, lead us through that with Dr. James Ferguson, uh, Mr. Ernie Regeer, and our other Nats and postdoc, Dr. Nancy Tiefel. So we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, you can go online to our website to register for this event and any other forthcoming Nats and Ideas events as they become available. And please do check out our website um, under Research Quick Impacts. We have a lot of work done by our panelists um, today, especially the pieces on uh, COVID-19 uh, resilience and the Rangers as well are all available there. So thank you very much. Take care and thanks for joining us.